Thanks for coming out. Thanks for, uh, yeah, I got a loud voice, Mr. Soundman. Uh, th thanks for everybody who sponsored. It's a tremendous and beautiful day. Table of contents. This is about uh, how I, as Stephen said, learned to hear myself a little louder and went from serving as an individual to, to serving through partnerships and eventually from the private sector side. It doesn't mean I think I evolved from something to something better. It's just I just learned, as Stephen said, to hear myself a little louder. And now, disclaimer, I am holding a digital device. Laughter, please. Look at them all laughing back there. And as you'll see in the presentation, uh, that in and of itself is pretty funny. Um, if you were a pop music fan in the mid-90s, I'm looking around, maybe some of you were. Yeah, there he is. You would have heard uh, a song called Angeline. It was a big hit, had a big TV star in the video. Uh, it was a great, great thing, and it was very exciting. And if you were to listen on a set of headphones, maybe at home in the evening, you would hear my lawnmower. <laughs> Interesting story. That record was made just up the block, as so many uh, wonderful records were at that time, uh, from a little studio just a few blocks up from here. I was fortunate enough to be in with a, with a great bunch of partners. We made simple rock and roll, soul, country, R&B records, and we were having a great a great run. So uh, I had these guys in the studio who did this record, and it had been raining for uh, eight, ten days, and it fin the rain finally let up, and I said, hey guys, we got to air this place out. Back then we smoked in studios. Terrible, terrible, I know. But we got to air it out, and I got to mow my grass. So they said, all right, all right, you can mow your grass. So I'm, I'm mowing my grass, I come back in, and they're doing a listen through, and they continued to cut while I went out to mow. And they, they were doing the harp solos. The harp solo, the harp part from Angeline was, was cut then. And we were listening back, and they heard the lawnmower, and they, they just thought it was hilarious. So they left it in. So um, that's that story. And we made records every day of the week, seven days a week, 12, 15 hours a day. And long about this time of day or maybe on toward evening a little bit more, I'd get tired of hearing whatever it was, no matter how good it was, and I'd go for a run. I love to run on the river. So one day, I went out for a run, and there was construction out there. They were mowing construction. can't remember exactly what, but I said to myself, all right, I'll just take off that way. Now, I hadn't been uptown that long. I've certainly driven around, but I hadn't really walked around the neighborhood, right? So here I am chugging through. I'm burning through that nine-minute mile, 2nd Street, 3rd Street, 4th Street. I'm going, and the neighborhood's changing. And I'm still I'm turning this way. I'm going that way, and I'm like, hmm, cool. Haven't been here, and uh, I see a group of kids in front of me, uh, teenage, teenage boys, and I just, okay, and I hop down off the curb, and I run diagonally across, I hop up on the other curb, and I just, and I'm trotting along, I'm going, ah, why did I do that? Why did I do that? Um, um, you know, did I give up on me? Did I give up on them? Why did I avoid them? Right then when I was, you know, taking my, drawing my little bath of white guilt, I hear, rabbit bah! What? Only one guy in the world calls me Robert Bob. Robert Bob! Phil. R&B singer extraordinaire. I had just done a record on him. Carpenter by day. Think, well, if you go back, you think Joe Frazier, you think Mike Tyson. This is a mountain of a man. He comes walking off a job site, and he's like, what are you doing here, Robert Bob? <laughs> and I said, Phil, he was, do he was rehabbing a house up here, uh, up about 15 blocks. And I said, man, I'm just, just taking a run. He said, man, it's kind of almost dark, and what do you, uh, maybe not a great idea. Uh, you know, I know this neighborhood. He said, anyway, how you doing? Oh, I'm doing good, telling him about the studio. And I we got into talking to him. I said, you know, we've been here a while. We're having great success. Uh, we're very fortunate, and a group of us want to get involved in some community service, some activities, maybe some youth services. And he went, what, what, the, okay. He said, just, just don't fall by here and, and think it's going to be all fun. Make yourself feel real good and, and do a little something like that. If you're in it, get in it. We knew each other well. We could speak to each other like this. And he said, if you want to do community service, let me show you something. So we were still within about 100 yards of those kids, and he hailed them over, those same kids. And he brought them over, and they obviously were, were, were responding to Phil. <laughs> Phil was running the neighborhood. And, he, and um, he got him close, and he pulled a $20 bill out of his pocket. He ripped it in half, and he handed half to the tough kid up front. And he pulled out his tape measure, and he pulled it out like that, and he said, find 16 and 7 eighths inches. Get the other half of the 20. Everything changed. 
everything changed for me too. Um, they couldn't do it. So he slapped the tape measure back in, fetched that 20 back out, stuffed it in his pocket, and he said, go home and study. And he looked at me and he said, okay, if you want to get, if you want to do this, um, let's get real. And he helped me. He introduced me to people. So I put this picture up as a representation of what was in my mind at the time. These are kids from programs that we eventually developed. Uh, they're not the kids from that day. Um, and and, and this, is, this picture is mired probably in my own idea of the deficit that surrounded and the distance I was from these people. And so you'll see this picture a couple times, and maybe we'll all evolve as, as I did. Meanwhile, back at the ranch, things were changing. The market said uh, analog recording was no longer the, the, the right thing to do, and we had to move to digital, hence the binary code. And that, of course, is me. I was scared to death. Now, here is a guy, I was so proud of myself, I could do, Paul, I could do something called a window edit. That's where you take a two-inch tape, and you roll it over on the record head. If there's one bad note, you can identify it. You can physically cut that note out. You can lay it to the side. You can go out to the end of the tape and fetch the right note back, tape it in, and nobody knows. Seamless editing, right? I could do it. I understood tape bias. I understood the physics of sound. I knew what a bass trap was, right? So I could do all this stuff. Meanwhile, they brought in a trainee, and he goes, click, copy, click, paste. Done. <laughs> Done. I get my razor blade out. And so, you know, I got the, the guys on the line, the engineers are learning this stuff. They're, they're getting started to get a coach. We get all kinds of gear, right? We get oh, Turtle Beach, we get Pro Tools, we get it all. And they had this piece of gear called an O2R from Yamaha, which was meant for old guys like me. It had an analog control surface, right? And it had a digital screen. And depending what was on a digital screen, the analog control surface did something different. Might be bass, might be treble, might be volume, might be compression, might be never going to figure that out, was what I might be, <laughs> right? But so they brought in a special guy to train me. And right then, for whatever reason, I had the idea. It seemed like the less folks knew about the old stuff, the quicker they got the new stuff. And I just thought to myself, let, let me go back, these people that Phil had introduced me to, and, uh, and see if we could get some the kids from the neighborhood in, you know, so the other thing I felt was devalued at the time, right, that my knowledge was devalued. I was Mr. Poopy Pants about that. But at any, at any rate, we began to get um, kids in from the neighborhood, and we started working with right alongside our engineers, and they were learning just as fast as the skilled folks who were trying to forget as much as they were trying to learn. It was really, really exciting. It was very fulfilling, and the kids were, were doing great work, but I noticed that some kids from some neighborhoods couldn't come. They wouldn't come. I didn't know why. I was new at this. Uh, and I reached out to find out why. Why aren't some kids coming? So we engaged a, a, a group of artists, and we went to six neighborhoods around town, and we put up questions, and we had artists, right, that, and, that facilitated, A, a dialogue, but B, we, we had chalk, we had canvas, and the kids could just respond to the questions. Six different neighborhoods, all the same questions. And then we were out there with, with police uh, you know, in a good way, neighborhood policing, putting up perimeters if it had been a hot zone. So there was this incredible moment where this police officer was standing next to a, a young person who had done this piece, and he's looking at this drawing of this place in this city, and he's seeing these lines of demarcation, and he said, wait a minute, there's three. These, these are three neighborhoods here. And the kid said, no, no, it's four. There are four neighborhoods. And he took the cop around back to an alley, and he showed him some new crew symbols. And, and in that moment, I felt like, here I am. The, my, my guys are all thrown in for a, a case of diapers because I am Mr. Poopy Pants about my devalued knowledge. But really what we have here is the police learning from the kids in the neighborhood that this substructure, this sub-political structure had changed. The control surface had changed in the neighborhoods too in a big way. And, and the knowledge laid with the kids. Uh, and it was those kids. So now, my opinion, like, who are these people? You know, they're resilient and, and brilliant, and it was, it was exciting for, for me to evolve through that. So here we go, the dancing peas. We start with partnerships, the public-private partnership, right? And uh, I have ridden many of the green peas, however they fall in, in, the, in the mix as an individual. A group gets together, loose aggregation of people till you hit a bump, 
then you form a formal partnership, maybe a nonprofit agency, and you partner up. That's all good. But then sustainability comes in. And we know, like right now, we don't have a budget, right? There have been times when it's been a year without a budget. And you get, you, you get the trust built in the community, and then the, the bottom falls out. And um, it, it, it's a real challenge to build that trust and to abide and stay. And as my friend Phil said, don't fall by here and get all happy for a minute and then disappear like everybody else does. All right? So I, I needed something. I needed something. Enter aquaponics. It changed the game for me. I took it from a private sector. I met these wonderful people sitting in the back of the room here. Uh, it, as, as you heard, it's, it's uh, aquaculture, fish, hydroponics, growing plants without soil, put it together. But there's a million things people can learn in these systems. Building them, conceiving of them, drawing them, the engineering, the mass, plumbing, electricity, certainly culinary, certainly agriculture, business. It's the future. A kid can see her future in here. It's fantastic, and the data is edible. That's not bad. So now we see the kids again, and I'm thinking, this isn't me doing 4-2. This is with, and the, the, the students had their own idea, their own creativity. They brought their own challenges to the scientists and to the business people. And what we began to do is do a piece of our own R&D, a piece of our own research, a piece of our product development across an actual problem in a community. What's the problem? Food desert. What's the problem? Lack of, in, lack of knowledge about, well, there's 7,200 plumbing jobs open in the region and nobody's trained for plumbing. You see what I'm saying? So you do your R&D. You do, if we get new filtration system, if the scientist says we need to change the water temperature, whatever it is, you bake that into the education day with excellent educators like you can find right there in the back of the room, and things begin to sing. That R&D, that testing, done over across a real community problem, really works. The company gets what they need. You bring along that nonprofit technique of, of grants, you bring along sponsorships, so you bring the modalities of the nonprofit service model right into the private sector, and it really does start to work. Oops. So here comes 2.0. Here you see CEOs, COOs of companies with new technologies that are going to come in and, and take this mantle and work in their communities, do their R&D, do their planning as a piece uh, of, uh, uh, of what they need to do as a company, but as a piece of community service and involve young people as they go. I think, is David here? Is he still here? Anyway, uh, one of our sponsors is, is one of the people, so I want to thank him. So what would you ask a kid? What would you say to a kid like that? You say, hey, what, what, look at this technology I have. Um, how can it solve a problem that you face every day? And can you teach me? Can you teach me, the business person, how to integrate what I'm doing? Um, so here they are again. And uh, cross the street, kids, right? When I met them, I crossed the street. I had to come to terms with that. Was not proud of myself. I had to pick my own ego up off the mat and learn from the students, learn from the young people in the towns up and down the river here. When I first saw them, I crossed the street, but now people cross street, they cross towns, they go from this state to that state, they cross oceans now. People from 12 nations have come to see what these kids know how to do. I'd like you to meet them. I'm, I'm not sure I can start the video. Atika and Ty. Hello, my name is Atika Mutt. Thank you for supporting the School to Table program and giving me the opportunity to work with such an amazing system and working with all these fellow students. As a future scientist, this program would definitely help improve my communication and critical thinking skills that I will bring to the laboratory in the future. Thank you. My name is Ty Rich McClendon, and thank you for supporting our greenhouse. My favorite thing this summer was taking care of the fish and the plants and observing them and seeing how to take care of things like pests and what happens when they have uh, deficiencies like iron deficiency. And what I can take away from this is uh, how to talk to people. So that helped uh, me come out of my shell.
Thank you.